I'm Amanda Stoffer, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Amanda Stoffer. Thank you for listening to Author Stories. We are now more than 350 episodes in and not slowing down anytime soon. It's because of you, the loyal listeners who tune in each day to Author Stories to hear the best author interviews around, and I just wanted to say thank you. On the right-hand sidebar of the website at hankgarner.com, you can find links where you can subscribe to the show, and it helps other people find the show. The more people subscribe, the higher we go in the rankings, and the easier people find us. Uh, I'd like to thank some sponsors uh, this week for uh, for helping us bring the show to you. I, your humble host, I have a brand new book out. It's called The Pandora Codex. Oliver Weber, book one, A Closely Guarded Secret, A Stolen Artifact, and A Madman Trying to Open a Portal to Hell. Can Oliver Weber become the hero he's meant to be? Pick up the Pandora Codex now. It's the first book in the Oliver Weber series. The second book, Jacob's Ladder, comes out very soon. Go ahead, dig into this series. Grab it now. You won't be disappointed. Uh, my friend Patricia Gilliam has a new series called Series Craft 101, and she has a series uh, of books, uh, the fictional character creator workbook, setting and world building workbook. If you are looking to uh, to put together a long running series like Patricia has done, uh, these are some things that she's learned and that she can help you to get on top of that makes managing a long series uh, much easier. Go check it out. There's a link in the show notes, and we'll be talking about it more. Bokera Brumley has a new book called Imani Earns Her Cape. It's a middle grade novel. You might have heard us talk about it on the show uh, just a week or so ago when Bokera was on. 12-year-old Imani should be celebrating the most important day of her life by eating myrrh fruit, casting fl- uh, flying spells, and laughing with her mother, but there's just one massive problem. Her mother's been kidnapped by a giant troll, and now Imani is lost in the Fey realm with no way home back to Virginia. Completing her rite of passage alone is inadvisable, but if Imani doesn't want to lose the only family she's ever had, she may have no choice. Transportal train travel, underwater cities, submarine sea dragons, and unexpected family all combine in Imani earns her cape. Thanks for listening to the show. At the end, as always, we have an audiobook clip from my friend Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have my new friend Amanda Stoffer on the phone with me, uh, or on Skype with me, joining me today on the show. She has a brand new book called Match Made in Manhattan. And uh, let me tell you guys, this book is... Uh, is witty and funny uh, and a real look into uh, into life today. It's uh, I think everyone will get something out of this book. Uh, welcome to the show, Amanda. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to have you. Uh, you know, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Um. So it's a, it's a little complicated for me because I'd always enjoyed writing. So in high school, I was a reporter and editor for my school paper. And in college, I was a reporter and then editor in chief of the Insider's Guide to Colleges, which is this book put out by St. Martin's Press that profiles 300 plus colleges around the country and sort of a guide for students trying to figure out which college is the best fit for them. Um, but all of this aforementioned writing was, was more reporting or analytical, less storytelling. And, um, the, you know, for me, when I started writing Match Made in Manhattan, the message and purpose were initially more important to me than the writing itself. So I didn't necessarily think of it as like becoming an author or a writer, even when I finished the manuscript or when I signed with my agent or later with Skyhorse. Um, but that said, I did find the writing process addictive and and now feel equally wedded to the concept 
and message and storytelling for, you know, book two that I'm working on now and hopefully future books. So, so I guess now I'm an author, but it sort of came to me more about like purpose driven writing. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, were you a bookish kid? Yeah, um, I definitely read widely and, and still do. I think as a kid, I read all the, the typical kid lit series that were recommended by my librarians, so like the Nancy Drews and the Hardy Boys, the Little House on the Prairie. Um, I think the one that stayed with me the most was Cynthia Voigt's series about the Tillerman family. I feel like they're, they skew more like towards a feminine o- audience. So I don't know if you read them or not, but like Dicey Song and Homecoming. And then she created this spinoff series about the secondary characters um, that like sort of the friends of the Tillerman family. And those books actually were sort of my favorite. I, I love this idea of these secondary characters taking on, uh, you know, the primary role. And um, also her illustrative like prose were was really sort of fantastic. And so as a kid, that was, that was what I always really loved to read. Um, today I, I read predominantly literary fiction, but I also have a solid fiction, like historical fiction shelf and a whole lot of books on architectural history. Cause that's, that's what I do in my day to day job. And obviously now I read a whole lot of women's fiction, um, both for comp titles, but also, you know, to sort of know what else is going on in, in that world. <laughs> Cause that's what I write in. I, I'm familiar uh, with the, uh, the the series that you talked about because um, uh, don't tell anybody, but I had uh, an older sister, and everything that she read got forced upon me, and, yeah. and then and then I started just going in and raiding her shelf and reading everything she had because I would be bored, and yeah, uh, yeah so n- no no shame in that. <laughs> but they're wonderful, and some of them. I mean, <laughs> then they took on you know the the runner, which is one of those like secondary ones that took on yeah. a male secondary character, so I could see that that would have you know. A male audience, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you you mentioned that your your day job is you uh, are an architectural conservator in yeah. New York City, um, but you talked about in college that you were you were doing all of this um, uh, journalistic type writing or um, yeah. type stuff. So w- tell me about that transition there. <laughs> well, well, first off, what what excited you and got you interested? in in doing that sort of stuff in college and then how did that transition over to architecture um so (laughs) i feel like i have such a like fluffy story about how i became a conservator but when i was in high school my high school had these things called forums and so once a month they'd bring in an outside speaker sometimes graduates of the high school and sometimes just people who were passing through and they brought through the restorer of the sistine chapel when i was a freshman and it's like, it's like t- totally one of those stories where you're like, oh, you go speak at a school and like you touch one person in that, you know, 1200 person audience. But I sat there during that lecture thinking that it all sounded so fascinating. Um, and I remember coming home and talking about it with my parents and my mom saying, but he cleaned the Sistine Chapel with Q-tips like that would take years and years and be really boring. <laughs> and I was kind of like, I don't care. It sounds amazing. Like pr- the idea of preserving, you know, and, and the continuity of, of art and architecture was super uh, intriguing to me. And then in college, I was a history major and an art history major. So you can kind of see how like, like the writer side, like kind of flows in there, but also the art history is really um, the, the foundation of, of preservation. And so I, you know, after college, I sort of knew I wanted to go into restoration. I was lucky enough to have a couple of really good mentors because at school you could take classes in the art gallery. So I got to work on actual objects and paintings when I was in college and then, you know, went through, found my way, went to graduate school and started restoring old buildings and is theoretically something that is a craft far, you know, separated from writing, but my protagonists all <laughs> are always architectural conservators. <laughs> so it's like a nice way for me to kind of blend those two worlds because I think at the, you know, at architectural conservation and, and I tend to work on mostly murals and frescoes and large format art in architectural settings. And um, it appeals to a lot of people, you know, we're all sort of interested in like the visual world around us, but a lot of people don't know about it. And so getting, weaving in some, some details of that more technical side, both the laboratory investigations and, and the also literally like shaving paint off of a wall with a scalpel. Um, it's, I, I like, I sort of like to incorporate that into my books to feel like my readers, if they're not you know, depending on how much they take out of the story, they're also like learning real, applic- like applicable facts about <laughs> a trade they maybe knew nothing about, and and that to me is sort of a, a nice way to be able to share the importance of preservation with the world. <laughs> well, um, you know, you look at different um, 
uh, focuses of art and, and you think they have nothing in common, but I think they all, uh, in, in, down at the, at the spirit level are all connected, uh, because we're, we're, we're all telling stories and, uh, you know, Fiona Davis uh, has this great series of books where she tells stories based, uh, you know, in in buildings in certain places. Yeah, and, and it's this because the 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 places have a story to tell, and even the the architects. We uh, a lot of times I think we think of them more as engineers, uh, but they're really telling a story and, and trying to set a mood and a tone with with the way things are done, and 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 then preserving those and 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 making sure that that that. That, that story of, of the place is not lost. Um, mm-hmm. I, I definitely see a connection there. Fiona is a very funny example because I actually went to a panel that um, she was speaking on in, in New York City a couple months ago, like maybe in November or December. And she was talking about one of her books and I had done I had done the restoration on that building. <laughs> and oh, then how I, cool. I think I think her new book coming out is on Grand Central and I'd worked yes. on that building as well. And so I went up to her afterwards and we had this, you know, the, you would think that we'd be ha- like sort of geeking out over the literary side of things. And instead it was like all about the buildings. <laughs> oh, I, I have a copy of the Grand Central book that I got a week or two ago from her publisher and it's, mm-hmm. it is amazing. Um, so yeah, I look forward yeah. To reading. yeah, it's, it's not out yet, but, uh, I think it comes out this summer. Everybody right. uh, needs to look forward to that for sure. Um, so, so you're, you're working as, uh, as a conservator and you are working your day to day life, uh, you know, preserving, uh, these places and, and these pieces. Um, tell me about when the writing bug bit you again. Yeah. So, um, as I, as I mentioned earlier, it was sort of driven by the concept behind it more than just saying like, oh, I want to be a writer or start a book. And what happened was um, I was my book began as a list of men's names scrawled on the back of a cocktail napkin. It's sort of like a funny story and made for a really good query cold open when you're pitching agents. Um, but I'd been at drinks with friends relating the details of my latest match.com dates. And I had been on match at that point for almost almost a year. Um, and I had. I had all of these sort of like textbook adventure, like dating adventure stories. You know, I'd been dumped before the first kiss and I donned full hazmat gear on a third date. I, you know, I'd, I'd fallen hard for these like tattooed indie folk singers who were now investment bankers and, um, and swapped far fetched, but true stories with a federal, an undercover federal agent. Like it was, it was really kind of a crazy year. Um, but through it all, I'd wound up with this dating history that, you know, mapped out on that fateful napkin formed what could easily be sold as like a quirky yet gripping romantic narrative. And so, you know, for a variety of reasons, um, particularly like the specificity of detailing characters, but also these big arcs and themes, to me, it was a story that hadn't been told already, but should have been. And, you know, part of it also, ha- there there are a lot of uh, themes that I've tried to hopefully subtly weave throughout the book, but what drove me at the time was that a lot of my friends were online dating as well and they just were not enjoying it. And I felt, and it wasn't that I was meeting categorically like better people. I don't even really know what that would mean, but it was that I sort of went into each date thinking that it didn't, it it was okay if it didn't lead to romance. If I learned something, you know, whether it was like about a new job I didn't know existed or a new neighborhood or, you know, a new outlook, then I was emerging net positive from that date. And it sort of became, you know, it, I feel like so many like women's fiction books like go back to the sex in the city ideal. But in certain ways, it was sort of like I was learning so much about the city around me and not just like the fabric, like the built fabric, but the people that walk the streets that you don't know. And I felt like seeing that sort of positive side to online dating, which often in pop culture becomes like a, a litany of bad dates, um, was what I wanted to get out there. You know, I was sort of like, why everyone can go meet the, you know, undercover federal agent who I met because he's still single. <laughs> and I felt like, you know, you, he was wonderful. And I, I liked this idea of trying to, to put a positive spin on it without having it be driven by a race to the altar, you know, have it more about the exploration and, and intake of the things around you. Well, a, a race to the altar or um, a, a tale that, that just winds up completely you know, in the gutter with needles in your arms or something. You right. Know, we, 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 right. <laughs> we've all seen that, that, uh, cautionary tale. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, at what point during this, well, you said you had been on match for about a year. Um, yeah. and so th- this came as, as you started making a list and kind of 
telling your friends about these experiences? Did did was it a light bulb moment of hey, you know, yeah. I need to write these down and and really uh, capture these moments? A hundred percent. So. Uh, to be clear, I get asked a lot like, oh, well, did you did you un, you know undertake this year of online dating in hopes of turning it into a book? And I was like, no, 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 not at all. Like this came at the very end. It was actually like the day before I closed down my match account. Um, but I had been we were sort of out like reminiscing over this wild year I'd had. And when you when we mapped out these names, you know, it wasn't not a, it wasn't written in paragraphs. It was on like a single cocktail napkin. But we sort of felt that each person or I sort of felt that each person had a takeaway, you know, and it would be like, oh, well, there's the guy who, you know, taught me to be a little bit less goal oriented or the guy who, you know, who taught me to enjoy like this kind of activity or food or whatever it was. And so whatever it was I was learning, there was sort of like a QED from each of the people who made it onto the napkin. Um, and I went home that night, you know, when the bar closed and got on my computer and was sort of like, I need to write this down now because <laughs> there's, there's so much in it that it is, you know, when you're online dating, it's not just the in-person meetup, it's all of the correspondence that goes up to it. And, and one of the things that I think is so unique about, about this stage of dating now, you know, that's been going on for a decade and will forever, I think, is that you come to know people in certain ways or have real expectations, um, before you meet them in a way that you wouldn't, if you just met someone at a bar or met them on the subway platform or, or got into, you know, set up. And so much is revealed in that correspondence, both in terms of how it aligns and doesn't align with your expectations when you actually meet them, that I was going to lose all that information because my match account was closing. <laughs> so I like stayed up that night and, and copied over some of the more interesting and illuminating um, messages that I had received essentially so I could start making the bones of an outline. And I, it was to me, I was living it at that moment. It was I felt like it was, I was really passionate about the story. And so when I finished the outline, it was, you know, I think it was like 11 a.m. the next day. I'd like pulled this all nighter, like it was a weekend, obviously, and flowing all this information into a Microsoft Word document. And I had an 80 page outline at the end of it. And that, Therefore, it was very clearly like, you know, I went back through it and was like, am I just telling like my dating tales, <laughs> which might be boring? Or like, is there a real thread like and sort of chassis to the story? And I felt that there was. And so that became this story I wanted to get out there. And then that and then the writing process just flowed out of that. You know, once I'm I'm a, a plotter, not, obviously <laughs> not a panther. And so by plotting all of this out, it, it it made it a very easy story for me to write because I knew exactly where my who my characters were, what their voices would sound like in my head. You know, they're all fictionalized as fiction, um, but but the inspiration was was very real. And so I found that creating all of that was very very quick and very intuitive because I knew where I wanted Allison to be headed, the protagonist, um, and I knew what I wanted her to take away from each of her dates. And each man is a new chapter in the book. So um, you know, it sort of progresses in a serial or episodic format. And so I felt like there needed to be a takeaway from each of them if they were going to you know, merit their own chapter. <laughs> um, well, speaking of, of that, um, the, the, the book is laid out uh, in a really unique style. It's part yeah. personal narrative. Mm -hmm. um, that that feels very um, uh, memoir, uh, mm -hmm. but yes. <laughs> pr probably um, narrative nonfiction is mm -hmm. is, is what it feels like. The, you know, that's that's kind of a, a, a big buzz right now. Uh, it kind of feels that way, uh, it, but it also is epistolatory uh, because yeah. you have all of these emails and, and personal exchanges and things like that. Um, Talk a little bit, if you will, about once you started gathering all this information uh, and you, you wrote a, an 80 page outline that is uh, impressive to any writer. <laughs> uh, how do you then start translating kind of all of the pieces that you've collected and then start, uh, you know, uh, plotting out the narrative and how this book is going to uh, lay out? But not only that, but Allison's journey through it. Yeah, Um so it, that that's a it's a complicated question because well, it was eighteen questions. <laughs> <laughs> because when I, I you know it's uh, very insightful that, that you think of it as narrative nonfiction in style because it was originally a memoir. So when I wrote the book, um, you know it was really easy to, to to maintain narrative voice because I was writing my own. Um, but what ended up happening was you know I, I, my original idea had been that I thought this book and I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not an expert. I'm not an agent. I don't work in publishing. And my idea had been that this book was going to be interesting because it was 
a universal story that was very specific at the same time. And so I felt like by making it memoir that I almost referred to this earlier, I think, but the idea that particularly, you know, whether you're in Manhattan or anywhere else, but like women reading this story who are single and, it, and it's not catered just to, you know, a single demographic, but certainly the people who are going through it, that they could finish a chapter and be like, oh, Amanda didn't end up with Mark, but that means that Mark is out there, like wandering the streets of Manhattan, like ready to be met. And he sounds wonderful. And like, these are the kinds of people I'm going to meet. And I felt like thinking that those characters that, that I, as an author, like had a ripe imagination somehow didn't hit that message home quite the same way to people because we could all invent, you know, myriad Prince Charmings, but the fact that they were real makes it, um, inspirational is the wrong word, but uplifting, I guess, uh, to the single readers out there. However, um, I'm sure you are familiar with this as well, but so much of selling memoir these days is platform and needing to have, you know, a, a wide reach and, and sort of built in audience, whether it's through having 10,000 Twitter followers or having, you know, a buy a regular column and a newspaper or something, but I didn't have any of those things. And then I knew I didn't like when I was pitching it, I was aware that I was lacking a platform and I was pretty upfront about it when I was querying agents. Um, but I had hoped that I would find an agent who said, I think this should be told in the first person, you know, told as a true memoir as well for the same reasons that it's like that reality is what makes it interesting. And I did, I found a couple a, a number of agents who sort of said, you know what, I think in this particular case, you can chuck platform out the window. Let's try and sell it and see what happens. Um, but the publishers were pretty firm about it. <laughs> um, and so my first agent query, um, submitted it to, you know, five or six, um, imprints. And I had one like very thoughtful revise and resubmit. But other than that, she kept coming back with very thoughtful feedback about the story, but that was constantly like, I just don't see how this can be sold as memoir because Amanda is not positioned to write a memoir. And so she was like, you know, there are many more imprints out there. We could keep going. She's like, but these are really good editors. And and based on their feedback, I sort of feel like maybe we should pay attention to it. And so we went back and fictionalized the novel or fictionalized the memoir that then became the novel. <laughs> and um, that process was not super hard. Uh, you know, fictionalizing the men is, is pretty easy. You obviously change identifying details. Um, but the message and the themes were all still pretty much there. The differences were that narrative nonfiction or memoir are told in a different story than, uh, you know, in a different fashion than women's fiction. And so I read a bunch of books on plotting women's fiction and ultimately sort of superimposed a story onto my story that made it, you know, sort of adaptable for the women's fiction audience. And primarily what that actually entailed was weaving in a, a work plot line because that's so integral to so many books. Like, so originally, actually, even though I am an architectural conservator, it was just like mentioned in dates, the way that you have first date conversation. Like, what do you do? And and I would say, here's the the building I'm working on. And and there were sort of small fa factoids about architectural history in New York, but but no day to day about the job. Um, and that all had to get sort of built in, which was easy for me because it is my job. <laughs> um, and working with that inciting incident and, you know, plot point one, plot point two, facts and a black moment, none of that had been there in the original manuscript. So that, that, you know, there was a lot of change that happened to the book, but ultimately none of the characters changed and the messages I don't think actually changed. It's just like the, the direction in which the story unfolded changed. And some of the people had to be reordered in order to heighten certain work themes, you know? Yeah. Um, you talked earlier about, um, that uh, that you wanted to tell a story that didn't necessarily uh, end the way a lot of uh, uh, women's fiction or romantic comedy or, or you know that that sort of genre yeah. we we expect certain things at the end uh, and then yeah. we we kind of <laughs> we kind of joked about uh, you know it's it's not memoir uh, where you know a lot of times in memoir we're we're looking for something salacious and we're looking for some uh, to to read about someone who completely goes off the rails uh, and then comes back at the end and there's a redemption story you know I think that's what right. makes a lot of memoir work yeah. and uh, you were very conscious to not uh, not go down trope alley and 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 fall into the same patterns that a lot of others do um, what was the uh, what was your motivation in doing this and, and how did you keep on track and to fight those uh, maybe reader expectations so that you could come up with something fresh and new? 
Yeah. So that's, that's a very good question. Um, that's like my favorite question I think I've been asked. So, so, you know, my idea, another sort of major theme that I was trying to incorporate was, you know, that society is evolving, like we're evolving and women are getting married much later or not at all. And they're all still falling in love, but that end goal of marriage and, and certainly marriage by a certain age has changed for a lot of us. And, you know, some are choosing to be child free and, and so on and so forth. But, you know, you can't, you cannot throw all of women's fiction into one bucket or another, but I've read a whole lot of it. And, and there are many authors and books in it that I love, but in general, the message of the genre hasn't changed a ton in terms of what we as women want, either from our partners or from our modern dating experiences. And, you know, instead of living that like prominent singular love story with a duo or like a one true pairing or OTP, um, the reality of modern dating and, and the sea of the people that the internet opens you up to is that you can fall for lots of people and in a relatively short span of time. And, and that can be like wonderful and elating and it can also be confusing. Um, and I wanted my book to communicate that there isn't like the one, but many ones that could work for each of us if only the timing worked out. And so you know, my, everyone hopefully has a different view when they read it. But my own view is that had circumstances in Allison's personal life been a little different, whether she was coming, not coming off of a bad breakup when she met person X or whether her work situation was going better for her. I, I personally feel that had the timing worked out, she could have been happy with at least five of the suitors in the book. And to me, that's like a really important point that like, we don't have to, you know, on the one hand, I don't, I certainly don't think that women should like settle or ever, you know, go below their expectations. But I sort of think there's an open mindedness to, to looking for maybe your, your slightly flawed, not totally perfect partner. (laughs) And, um, and, you know, part of bringing that, that message to market has a lot to do with finding an editor, an agent, an editor who believe in you. And, you know, my, my editor, Amy Singh really believed in that story And what's been interesting is that, you know, I don't, I don't want to spoil the ending. Um, but certainly we wrote, I wrote a number of iterations of the ending for her because we flip flop back and forth about how closely we needed to follow the traditional women's fiction trajectory. And, you know, obviously I was on the side where I was trying to rail against it and she was on the side of like, we need to sell books and and it's a business. And, and, and so we flipped back and forth a lot. And now at the end of the day, I have like six, you know, various endings that I feel like one day I should bind into an anthology or something. Um, but it was, it was a really interesting process to think, to, to balance what message you sort of want to get out there, but also what book you want people to pick up and read. Um, and it's been, it's been, the reception has been really interesting because I would say that it's, it's maybe 50, 50 where I have, you know, even trade reviews are a good example. Like I, I had one trade review that that's talked about how it was, um, like a new and fresh take on the rom-com. And I think they called it like, not your mama's rom-com. And I was like, I like that. Like, I like that idea that it's sort of somehow in the genre, but, but apart from it. And then I had another that just saw it as, like a very fluffy, like missed all of those themes from it and saw it as like a fluffy beach read and called it like a frothy read. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that that wasn't exactly the point of <laughs> what I was trying to write. And those people that see it as frothy tend to be very disappointed in the trajectory of the book. They sort of feel like, oh, it becomes too many men and like we can't keep them straight. And, um, you know, I know there's a lot of men. There were actually even more when I submitted my manuscript. You know, I think it was like 42 and now it's down to 25 or something. <laughs> and my feeling had been that you don't have to keep them straight. Like the, once they've come in, they exit shortly after because each person has their own chapter. But also the idea is, first of all, it's very true to life. That's sort of what happens when you're dating. (laughs) Um, but the other part is that you are, you are, you are changing your direction because of the people that come before the person you end up with, you know, or don't end up with. And so I liked the idea that you know, if we're, let's consider it, consider it like a line of four people, A, B, C, and D, that like A tweaks Allison in a certain direction so that when she meets B, she responds a little bit differently and so on and so forth. And that she's, you know, a product of her experiences. Um, but that's, it's hard for the reader who comes in and wants just the, you know, the one true pairing or at most like love triangle. You know, there are, there are a lot of readers who are kind of like too many men. I couldn't get past it. (laughs) Um, and I appreciate that, but you know, and the book isn't going to be for everyone, but, but that was what I was trying to achieve with it. (laughs) Well, and, and you learn really quick, um, really quickly that, uh, 
people come to books with their own expectations and and some of their criticisms uh, you know they and, and this is this is one of the hardest parts of being an author is learning to separate um, true criticism that uh, and, and realizing that there are play, the parts of your craft that you can work on and mm-hmm. and yes. and a- accepting that criticism as a gift uh, almost because it's stretching you to be a better you. Uh, mm-hmm. But then there's another category of criticism where the reader brought their own expectations and you didn't meet their expectations for whatever reason. And that's just not your fault. That's just the nature of uh, you know, millions of people out there with the ability to pick up your book. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it, it's a weird place where we live where, um, critics have such a strong voice. And, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't have criticism, I'm not saying that at all. Uh, yeah. but it's, you know, the, the author has to learn to, you know, to, to decide which one of those is valuable for her career or not. For sure. And, and, you know, to, to sort of tie it back to what I learned all about in college, you know, as an art history major, you read so much art criticism and theory. And the central tenet is that every viewer is going to you know, bring to the work of art, like something from their own background and their own bias. And that their work, like a painting, will reflect back to the, the viewer some of their own experience. And I, I certainly don't want to say, like, my book is high art or anything like that. But, uh, you know, literary is, arts are an art. And I feel like that is what gets folded in there, that people are, ref- it's reflecting back, you know, what people have expectations from their own lives or what they want in their own lives, you know, any of those things. And, and women, especially a book like this about finding your match online. And I think it, it cuts very close to the bone for a whole lot of readers. You know, so it's such a common experience these days. And I think people probably hoped to see it either parallel or be better than their own experiences, you know, and, and sometimes it is and sometimes it's not, you know. Yeah. Uh, one thing I love about uh, the, the way that you portray your characters is that they are not two dimensional characters. Uh, and I harp on this a lot about uh, writing real characters that reflect real life. And uh, a lot of times um, in, in all sorts of, of genres, uh, we, we tend to put people uh, men and women in, in very narrow but very solid categories. So mm-hmm. in a lot of women's fiction, you're going to find men that are either broken or are the knight in shining armor. And <laughs> and rarely is there much between those two. Um, and uh, my wife and I are working on our 25th year of marriage. And uh, you, you learn really quickly uh, that people are all sorts of things uh, between those two extremes <laughs> and one day i'm an awful person and the next day i'm the best person and uh you know but you're always striving to be better and some days you miss the mark some days you don't some days you're just uh, you know uh, some days you just laugh and <laughs> you know people are people and i i love that you uh, are not afraid to show us uh, that in in the midst of this experience you're having is that you're meeting real people that have real ups, real downs, uh, and they're they're just people. Um, Mm -hmm. When you are, uh, when you're going through these experiences, uh, was this a a conscious effort for you that you were um, uh, not trying to hone in and and pick apart their character to find out if this was going to be a solid match? Or were you consciously observing uh, kind of the human nature, e- even though you, you weren't planning to write about it at first, you, you were gathering clues about people. What, was that something that you consciously did? Yeah, I was, you know, <laughs> I wish I could say that I was consciously doing it because I feel like it makes me sound maybe smarter or more discerning, <laughs> but, but I don't think Or so. creepy. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. Or judgmental, I guess. <laughs> but um, I think I, I wasn't, you know, I, I sort of, I, I had a, my dating experience obviously like really closely mirrors Allison's and like her, I had only had very long term relationships with people who had started off as friends and going into it, you know, you so much of what you read are those, you know, Tinder horror stories or whatever. And not even, I don't even mean like the, the serial killers. I just mean, you know, where people meet these total stuff shirts who are, you know, not interested in, in anyone in, other than themselves. And, and I sort of went into it expecting to, to meet my fair share of jerks. And I was pleasantly surprised that I basically met zero. And I think what it came down to was not, it wasn't that I was sitting there trying to 
analyze or, or dissect their characters so much as I was maybe trying to do the opposite, like just trying to see if I could have like an enjoyable night and learn something. You know, I think early on I actually did meet probably my worst dates happened very early on just coincidentally. And I felt like, you know, where they just didn't click for one reason or another and, or were a little creepy. And I felt like after that, I went into it saying, well, and my goal is not going to be to meet my boyfriend. Like my goal is going to be to have an interesting conversation and learn something. And going into it with that attitude, it, it actually felt exciting. It was almost like, oh, I'm going to like, you know, unwrap a present or like watch a new TV show or something. And, um, and I feel like everything that came out of that, what you learn about what everyone else is dealing with, that you can never really anticipate how someone's going to react, all of that just came from sort of patiently waiting to see what would happen. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, and, it, and it's funny because what you were saying about about multidimensional characters, you know, Allison has garnered has garnered a lot of criticism for being picky or hypocritical, um, and and that was part of the point. You know, it wasn't just that I she's probably a little bit pickier than I am, and it wasn't. Um, I didn't want to have this girl who was sort of like the apple of everybody's eye. Like I, I felt like we all make mistakes and can't always correct them. And I felt like it was important to weave that into her story, too, and also to deal with how, you know, it is hard, like being on the on both sides of dating, you get you get your heart stomped on, but you also have to do the heart stomping sometimes. And I don't think anyone has really developed a way to be elegant about that. And I feel like a lot of the conflict for her came with how, it, you know, came with dealing with how to not hurt other people. Um, and I and she wasn't perfect at it. Um, but I, I think that 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 lends itself to criticism for being picky or hypocritical because, you know, she's that part of the issue of timing is that you have to catch us when we're calm and rational. And sometimes she made quick decisions, which is why looking back, I can say, oh, I think she could have ended up with five of these people, but she didn't end up with at least four of them. Right. <laughs> um, so and the reasons for that have to do with her making a decision that maybe at a different time would have been different. You know, she might have decided to stay with that person. Um, after going through this year long experience that, uh, that the book came from, uh, would you recommend, uh, that experience to anyone else? A hundred percent. You know, it's funny. I feel like I've done, you start doing events and speaking engagements when, when you're an author and, and mine have been sort of like 50, 50 in terms of their audience. Like some are literary events where you speak at bookstores and libraries, but I've also done a lot of singles events. <laughs> and, and the reason for that is, um, I, you know, I didn't pitch them that way. People have come, have come to me and said, do you want to speak at a singles event? And I always find it sort of funny because I'm, I've been married for six years. I have a kid, like I am so far <laughs> removed from like the, you know, current modern day dating experience. I think it all changes, you know, with new Tinder wasn't around when I was on match.com. Um, and so it's always funny for me to be giving out dating advice. So instead of, you know, I, I do try out the platforms like with my husband next to me, I'll be like, okay, we got to know the functionality of Bumble so I can speak about it. Um, but I also, I feel like the overarching message has sort of been, keep your eyes open, like look around you and, and, and just think of it as a learning process and, and don't go, you know, and, and you can go out there hoping to meet someone. Obviously that's the goal for all of us or we wouldn't be on these dating apps, but, um, see if you can learn, like play games with yourself. Say like, can I learn one thing tonight? Or if, you know, if, if they're really boring and I can't learn anything, can I at least get recommendation for like a new Netflix series to binge or, or if they're great and you don't, but they're not for you romantically, can I turn him into my running partner? And you know, all of these are things that I did when I was dating, but I feel like those, those sort of mantras still apply, even if I'm old and removed from the dating scene. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Amanda, the, the book is called match made in Manhattan. Uh, I, I think everyone's going to love this book. Um, where you. can people find you online? Um, if they're just learning about you and want to uh, follow along and, and I, I know you're working on book two now. Uh, so yeah. where can people kind of stay up to date on what's going on with Amanda? So I, I have, um, all of my like speaking engagements and things will get updated on my website, which is Amanda Stoffer dot wordpress dot com. And I'm also on Twitter and Instagram, you know, mostly I think on Twitter is where my announcements come out. If I'll have any bookish news or, or reviews and I'm a spark seven, um, on Twitter. Awesome. Uh, Amanda, I wish you the utmost success with the book. And, uh, when book two comes out, please let us know. Oh, I definitely will. I had so much fun chatting with you. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. 
Now stay tuned for a special audio from clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane the series. Of my father's stone manor house. The house would eventually stand on what had been old Baltus's pumpkin field, the land where I had found my grandfather's head. Father had chosen the spot for its view of the Hudson River. Knoll was to be a grand mansion in the Gothic Revival style, but at the time the mansion was but a few foundations of Van Brunt stone. I had become fond of the place already, the idea of it, and I spent many a night alone in a shack on the property. My mother disapproved. She would have me sleep in the room across from hers in our townhouse. But I was fifteen and did not answer to her. I kept a bottle of spirits hidden in the crook of two walnut trees near old Baltus's grave. I thought he would approve of the gesture. I had stopped along my way to fetch it out. At the moment the first pull of liquor touched my throat, I heard a ghastly, inhuman laugh. I was not alone in the woods. Had God sent the horseman after me? Had I sinned that terribly? I ran through the wood and found the field where Knoll was to be built. The outline of the foundations was barely discernible beneath the snow. An apparition stood there. Though I have seen him many times since, I shall never forget my first glimpse. Gaunt in moonlight, headless, exuding power and malice. A magic thing in the land of the ordinary. The headless horseman of Sleepy Hollow. What chills those words evoke. It charged at me, hatchet raised. I stood transfixed, unable to move, unable to even imagine escape. This was the servant of God, after all, sent to strike down sinners. I hurled the bottle from my hand, ashamed that I had become a drunkard as Baltus had been. It shattered against the foundations of Knoll. I stretched out my arms and awaited judgment. A piercing white light broke the darkness. The horse reared. Not my Dylan, cried Agatha, appearing from the wood. She held a skull in her hand. It shone brightly as a diamond. And in that moment I understood. The horseman did not serve God. He served my grandmother. Perhaps in that moment I came to see Agatha and God as one and the same. The unholy spirit fought her command. A foreleg of the demon horse struck my head with such power that I fell backwards with a cry and knew no more. I carry the scar to this day. A slight indentation in my temple, barely noticeable. In my days of courting I was told that when I am angry the patch of insulted skull bone will stand out in a disturbing manner. I have never had occasion to see this phenomenon, however, as I am generally well pleased whenever I pass a mirror. 